Hi everybody, Ko here with another very special, very fun playthrough. This is Owlcat's Warhammer 40k Road Trader. Before we begin, let's go ahead and, and talk real quick about what you're about to watch. I love CRPGs. What we're going to do in this run is called a 100 co cent run. What that means is I'm pretty much going to do every single thing I want to do. We'll probably explore every character arc, every major quest, uh, every side quest. We'll explore all the environments, do everything there is to do. That's the plan for this playthrough. Uh, I do want to point a couple things out before we get started, as I want your experience as a viewer to line up with what I'm delivering so expectations are met. Or more importantly, if this isn't your thing early, you know not to waste your time. <laughs> the way that I play these games is I generally play them on a very hard difficulty, way above my pay grade, and I save scum, finagle, and talk to chat to very arduously pull myself through them. There will be lots of mistakes. There will be mismanagement. There will be me forgetting major mechanics and abilities. There will be times when you will take your monitor between your two hands and shake it vigorously, screaming at Pasco to properly do what you know is the right thing to do. That is what this playthrough is going to be. It's going to be a very thorough, arduous, painful watch. But it's going to be a lot of fun. Because that's my goal with these games. I play these games not to do well, not to one-shot everything, not to do the best strategy. I play these games to have a really good time and just enjoy them. So I just want you to know early, uh, that's the kind of play that you're getting into here. Probably gonna be pretty long. So buckle up, let's get started. We as developers are always striving to improve our work. To do this, we need information we can get. Oh, absolutely, yeah. take it. All right, take up the mantle of a rogue trader, the scion of an ancient dynasty of daring privateers. What? Oh, one second, one second. Um. Oh, great. Um, over there, uh, let's see. Daring privateers that reign over the trade, protectorate, and explore the fringes of the known galaxy, darkness looms over the bloodline of Von Valencius as it faces multiple threats from within its own ranks and without as countless enemies seek to destroy the most daring and brave agents of humanity. It is up to you, chat. You. To hold the reins of the shattered protectorate and forge a new path for the Von Valencius dynasty. Currently finding itself in a vortex of wars, intrigues, calamities, and heresy. The stakes are high and rise even higher as you cross paths with terrifying power, terrifyingly powerful and ambitious adversaries in the darkness of the Coronis Expanse. Yes. Difficulty. So normal, I've been told, is still pretty hard. Um, you can see that everything is pretty much zeroed out. Some minor bonuses to, to things here. Daring. It's not recommended for players not familiar with Warhammer 40k. Um, this is when we this is when we really see the zeroing out. This is this is when there's no advantages to the player. Hard is when we start going into like the bad modifiers. <laughs> this is this is when things get a little nasty. Um, and then unfair is is the thing about Owlcat games is unfair actually is unfair. So I attempted in a previous Owlcat game to try the unfair difficulty and the first enemies in the game were one-shotting my character. So I would recommend this difficulty for those that have mastered this. They know exactly what build every character is going to be going in and are going to have fun with a lot of reloading. Um, I think like previous Pathfinder games, I'm gonna go to hard. Hard is still brutally difficult, but this way I have a little bit more wiggle room in learning this because I do not know the Warhammer 40K Rogue Trader system. We're gonna be learning this as we do this. So I'm gonna go with hard. I'm gonna go with hard. <laughs> Choosing this difficulty is not recommended for players not familiar already with Rogue Trader's system as well as its implementation in this game. Do you confirm your choice? Mm. All right. 
So we've got some pre-made characters, but we're not going to do that. We're going to do a custom character. So let's talk real quick about what we're doing here. So I have a good idea about what I want to do. I, I have a couple members of the community that have kind of helped sketch a guideline of where I can take this character. Um, but I'm still planning on kind of going through everything and, and going, you know, pouring over all the different options and, and choosing what I'm going to do. So at first I thought about going an operative, which is like a ranged DPS class, but I do that a lot. So we're going to mix it up a little bit. I really enjoyed our last playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3 where I played a bard. I really liked having more options and social situations and kind of playing that more supporty role. So that made me look at officer. And the cool thing about this game is you pick kind of like a base class and then you kind of mold him into what you want to do moving forward. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with an officer and we're going to kind of mold him to be a ranged DPS support class as well. So that's the plan. I also will be looking over Psyker and Operative, though. I don't really want to do a melee run for now, although that would be kind of badass, but I, I don't want to do that quite yet, so... This guy looks pretty cool. He's got a good good office serial look to him. I love that it matches the model to the, the profile. He looks pretty badass. Oh, that's a Psyker right there. That's cool. Oh, dang. That's a melee guy. Same there. Dude, these profile pictures are awesome. Oh man. I like this one. Nah, we're, we're doing this one. We're doing this one. Yep, that's our look right there. I'll see you terminated. I am but a vessel. For the higher purpose. Success is the only outcome I accept. Ooh. Two arms! Ooh. I'll make it happen. This could be an opportunity. Oh, I like this guy. Engage the engines. Yeah, yeah, we're doing this one. Oh my lord, look at all these options. Nice. Nice. Okay. All right. So the first thing that we have to pick is where we're from, our home world. Now, what's interesting about this is this is this isn't like a normal background. This is a huge choice you make about your character. So, what we need to do is first let's let's do this real quick. First, we go to archetype. This is, this is kind of like our class. And what we're gonna do here is pick what we wanna be, and then we're gonna go back to Homeworld and figure out what best fits with us. So Warrior is straight up melee. Um, Officer uses willpower and fellowship to improve combat capabilities. So these guys, this is what I think we're gonna do. These guys are like pure support, basically. Operative intelligence and perception to find and exploit weaknesses and exploits are kind of like a stacking buff if i remember properly that does all sorts of extra stuff based on your abilities if the operative hits a target with an exploit stack the attack deals 5x perception bonus more damage yeah the damage is also increased by 10 percent for each exploit on the target yeah Okay, so that's kind of huge. And then a soldier is a master of all ranged weapons, quickly able to assume an advantageous position from where they stand, ready to rain fire on the enemy. While well-trained in a highly diverse range of arms, a soldier is particularly proficient at blasting their targets with burst fire and area weapons. So this is like the more snipery critical one, and this is like the, the big heavy hitter bolter one. All right. Now, what's cool is, as you can see, whenever you pick one of these base classes, you can then feed into secondary classes at 16. The soldiers can become arc, arc militant, arch militant, master tactician, bounty hunter. Operatives can become grand strategist, bounty hunter, or assassin. 
So you kind of like mix and match the classes. Bolter Supremacy, you know it. Yes. All right, so we're going to go probably Officer. And then I think into Master Tactician. Yeah. Okay. So, as an officer, our focus is going to be willpower and fellowship. And I do eventually want to go into... I want to be able to have guns as well. So we'll probably Good go into show. ballistic as well. Thank you, Bulldog, with a five bomb. Appreciate you, buddy. Okay. So, now that we have an idea of what we're going to do, particularly willpower and fellowship, let's go back to here. So, a death world has survival instinct. Once per combat, when the wounds of a death world character drop below 30, they gain 20% of their max wounds as temporary. So they have like a, a little ward. Their focus is strength, agility, and toughness. So this, this is not for us. This is for more melee. They also get all sorts of talents down here. Death world characters take a toughness bonus, less damage from flame toxic and bleeding. Once per combat, when a death world character is suffering from stunned, blindness, or immobilized, the condition's ignored, and instead they get a bunch of, man. Yeah, this is a great, this is a fantastic, like, melee tank background. Okay. Voidborn. Humans birthed in the belly of a void vessel. Their primary feature is fortune. A voidborn character can reroll any failed attack dodge parry characteristic of a skill test with a 20% chance of success. Damn. They're a willpower int modifier. Anytime a Voidborn character scores a critical hit, there's a 10% chance to double the damage. These guys are, these are very RNG. While a Voidborn character has more than 50% wounds, health, all chances of all creatures in a three cell radius are increased by 10%. When they have less than 50%, they're all reduced by 10%. Yeah, this is like a Gamba. Voidborn is Gamba. This is the Gamba class. Anytime an ability or talent uses the fellowship bonus, a Voidborn character can instead use Int. Additionally, Voidborn characters can always upgrade intelligence, even if their archetype doesn't allow it. Interesting. Hive world. A hive world's population is so dense that great swaths of the surface of the world are frequently covered in gargantuan cities bejeweled with towering spires that pierce the atmosphere. They're an agility fellowship. Now, they go down in willpower, though, so this is probably not for us either. Um, although, maybe. Strength in numbers. Hive, hive world characters gain one plus fellowship bonus I divided by two resolve. Resolve is it influences how efficiently and for long characters can fight in the battle and determines the amount of momentum. Momentum's a very important mechanic here. So uh, momentum is kind of like a group energy bar. It can be positive or negatively influenced. It allows for like really powerful big moves. We'll go into that later. Okay, so. Hive World characters gain a bonus to resolve if they're three or more creatures, allies, or enemies in a three cell radius. But they suffer a minus two penalty with no creatures around. So this is a very party-centric thing. Camaraderie. Hive World characters can pass willpower resistance tests using their fellowship. Okay, so that... Huh. If a high world character has melee superiority, the effect is increased by 10. Okay. All ranged weapons dealing physical damage have plus one damage, 5% armor pen, and one rate of fire, and minus five to recoil. So they're all about physical damage. If a high world character starts their turn adjacent to an ally character, the high world gains plus two movement. If they end their turn adjacent to allies, they gain plus two movement on their next turn. Okay. Hive world characters gain a 50% bonus to dodge the first attack of opportunity every round. Okay, hive world seems 
okay. Seems okay. Forge World. The domain of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Intelligence and toughness with a minus on fellowship. They don't have... They don't have a feature. Interesting. First attack in combat with any plasma melter or power weapon deals additional damage equal to the int bonus. Forge World characters gain a toughness bonus on deflection against the burning effect in flame weapons. They gain a stacking 10% bonus to hit chance and dodge against any target they hit with a single target attack. Well, that seems pretty good. Wait, look at the top. Forge Worlds get more tabs to go through? Hold on. Um, while wearing heavy armor, Forge World characters gain a bunch of stuff and can't fall prone. Damn. Forge World characters can use persuasion, coercion, and commerce based on intelligence instead of fellowship. Interesting. Oh. So this is, this is a, you get to pick your feature. Forge World characters gain plus 10 plus int bonus crit hit or extra dodge or extra armor. Cool. So they get like an entire tab up there. Oh, Imperial does too. Oh, wow. Uh, Imperial is humanity's finest. Imperial War characters can select any characteristic except for weapon skill or ballistic skill to add a plus 10 bonus. Um, okay. While under 40% wounds, Imperial characters gain a bonus to uh, characteristics and resolve. 10% crit hit chance and 10% armor against Xenos or demonic creatures. Your allies gain half the bonuses of no, no heresy. The Emperor. Yeah, I'm doing my part, chat. No other character in the current party has the same archetype as this character. The first use of any ability from this archetype costs minus one AP. Interesting. All allies, excluding dirty Xenos, in the current party gain plus five to the same characteristic as was chosen for humanity's finest. Hmm. Fortress World, never stop shooting. Each time a Fortress World character kills an enemy, they gain 10 stacks of never stop shooting. At the start of their turn, there's a Stacks of never stop shooting percentage chance that the first attack this round will cost zero AP and not count towards the attack limit per round. If the effect triggers, all stacks are lost. Dang, dude. Dang. Combat Addict. Fortress World characters gain plus seven to ballistic skill, perception, and willpower while in combat. All out of combat, their int fellowship, perception, and willpower are decreased by seven. Okay, that immediately makes me not very interested because we want a character who's who's good out of combat <laughs> at, at talking and stuff, and those are a lot of talky things there. Each round of Fortress World characters gain a stacking 1% bonus to dodge against range attacks for each shot they made during this round. Okay. Fortress World's characters first reload and... Man, this is like... This is the gunner class, man. This is the gunner class, or the gunner background. Gunner homeworld, I should say. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So for us... I'm thinking we're looking here. I'm thinking we're looking hive world. I like camaraderie a lot because this makes it so we wouldn't have to focus on willpower, that we could just dump points into fellowship, which is one of our, our, our the key stats of officer, and we would get a willpower resistance check there, which is one of the key things about willpower. Hmm. Can we see the Imperial World options? Sure. It's pre It says right here, it's pretty much any characteristic for a 10 bonus. So it's, it's you can see on the right there. 
Yeah. Alright, so let's try Hive World. And the big thing we're going to remember here is we want to be using physical weapons. We want to start next to other people in our team and end next to other people in our team. And we're going to want to position our character to where he is close to other people in the team. Okay. It's a lot to remember, but if we get it, if we get it in, into habit, I think we'll be all right. All right. Origin. Now, Origin is very similar to Homeworld in regard that it basically can define how your character's played in some ways. Um, so, like, an Astra Militarum Commander gets all these skills added and then gets Regimental Tactics. The Commander and all allies deal an additional 20 plus 2x Perception bonus damage to enemies that are adjacent to the Commander. Now, this, I think, yeah, can only be used once per combat. So this is a... This is, I believe, a momentum skill. I think. It doesn't say that it is, but I think it is. I think. Yeah. Oh, it's not. It's not a momentum skill. Wow. Wow. Well, that's just amazing. Um, ballistic and Perception are good. We're not really... I don't think we're going to be doing too much Perception with our main character, though. Suppressing fire! Okay. Field of Fire. So these are all things that are based on the Regimental Tactics stuff. Okay. Every time the commander uses a heroic act, the commander gains plus five to all their characteristics until end of combat. While the Astra Militarum commander is adjacent to any ally, the commander deals an additional perception to damage to all enemies adjacent to the commander's allies. Oh, interesting. And it stacks with the skill. Okay. Commissar. Ooh, it actually... Hmm. This is, this is like one for my the class I want to be. At all costs once per combat. The next single shot or single target melee attack applies the following effects. The target becomes marked. The ally who kills him gains an additional turn with plus two AP and plus four MP. Wow. That's pretty good. Uh, it adds to fellowship and weapon skill, which are our core skills, actually. That's awesome. And this looks to be a very uh, support one. While the Commissar's ally is under the effect of at all costs, the ally suffers 50% damage, but gains plus two AP and plus four MP. Oh, wow. So that's, that's kind of brutal. While the Commissar is adjacent to an enemy, all their allies gain more resolve. When the Commissar grants an additional movement point to an ally character, they give plus two movement points more. The Commissar kills a target with at all costs. They can use at all costs once more this combat with zero AP. Is that, can that only happen once? Oh, dude. Oh, that's wild. I guess you can only do it once. Yeah. That's wild. Okay. It's not listed, but you also gain an insane hat. What? It's not wrong, dude. Dude, that even looks, oh my God, even looks like my dude. Okay, this is this is a consideration. Crime Lord. Surefire plan. Gains an int bonus stack. Okay, so we're not, we're not really doing int. This would be great for an operative. Yeah, so this surefire plan is an int thing. Weapon skill, yeah, this is, this is, this is for operatives. Killing plans, bonus to dodge and parry. If the crime lord has no stacks, they gain a stack of, of surefire, which is their feature? Feature. Yeah. Um, once per combat, if the crime lord has at least one stack of surefire plan, 
They do not die from lethal damage. Instead, they heal 5x times the Surefire plan stacks of maximum wounds, lose all stacks, and can no longer gain Surefire. Oh my god, that's amazing. That's perfect. Um, gain Surefire plan stacks. Oh wow. The last plan. I love it. I love it. Mm -mm. Okay. Ministorum Priest. Oh, ho, 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 ho. War him. It's momentum buff. And a, and a WP buff. Okay, so this, this is not really for us, but that's cool. Litany of Purification. Shield of Faith. Litany of Hatred. The Emperor Protects. And fl Flensing Faith. Cool, man. Yeah, again, not for us, but very cool. Okay. Chat, the Emperor Protects. The Emperor Protects. Navy Officer. Okay, this is, this is one of our big considerations. This one and Noble are the two that we're really going to be looking at. The Imperial Navy is responsible for the fleets of void ships that assert the dominance of the Imperium amid the stars and fulfill others' duties connected to the void and warp travel. You used to be a Navy officer and a commander of a void ship, pardoned in numerous battles and famous for resounding uh, victories. Brace for impact. For one round, the Navy officer and their allies in a three-cell radius, and again, that synergizes real well with strength in numbers, the exact same thing, three-cell radius. For one round, the Navy officer and their allies at a three-cell radius gain plus two deflection for each archetype taken by the Navy officer. They cannot be forcefully moved or over-penetrated? Oh, my. To be very clear, um, plus two def deflection determines the amount of damage deducted whenever an enemy hits the character. So I have to admit, I don't... Archetype defines a character's role in the game. So our first arch archetype would be Officer, and our second archetype will be Master Tactician. But even then, that's two damage and four damage? And it can only be used once per comp? That doesn't seem very good. That doesn't seem very good. Plus six if Exemplar counts, which it probably will. Is that underwhelming or is it just me? Like, I guess we don't really know what max wounds are. Maybe maybe two's a lot. But, huh, and only once per combat. Let's see what else they can do. They're a fellowship, so I mean, that's immediately makes it something for us that we want. Oh, and they're commerce and demolition, which I mean, can't go wrong with demolition. Do not falter. All allies affected by Brace for Impact do not suffer the negative effects of melee superiority for the entire combat. Melee superiority. In melee combat, any target surrounded by more allies than enemies receives a plus 10 weapon skill bonus for each additional ally. Okay. So if we do this for the rest of combat, we don't have to worry about melee superiority. That's kind of cool. Scatter. All allies affected by Brace for Impact suffer only half damage from all attacks of opportunity. All allies affected by Brace for Impact gain 30% to cover penetration, and the Navy officer permanently gains 15% to cover penetration. Okay, so wait a second. This seemed underwhelming, but when you start factoring all this in, all of a sudden it's getting kind of crazy. Brace for Impact also allows the Navy officer to use any ranged weapon in threatened areas knocks enemies prone and pushes them one cell away during the effect. Okay. All allies affected by Brace for Impact gain an extra turn with 0 AP and 3 MP and increase their cover efficiency by 20% for one round. Okay, so, <laughs> this, that, all, all of a sudden this went from somewhat underwhelming to, okay. So basically, we could group up at the beginning of combat, hit Brace for Impact, 
and then like deploy out with bonuses for that turn and get some permanent turns and okay so that's it has gone from underwhelming to relatively whelming the extra turn is only for movement that's true but that still could be huge that still could be huge that means we could all fire and then get a turn to like reposition after that it's I, it's it's not overwhelming it's it's whelming oh wait 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 chat's saying that's a momentum skill this is a momentum skill no, it's not. No, it, it clearly says if it's a momentum skill. Yeah. Are you whelmed, Alpacultica? You are? Okay, cool. Great. Yeah, a one-time use skill is not a momentum skill, necessarily. No. I think it'll clearly tell us if it's a momentum skill. All right, so that obviously is a, is a big, cool potential. This is where it gets interesting. Noble, you serve me. The noble assigns one ally who will become their servant until the end of combat. Anytime the noble abilities affect the servant, the servant gains plus five to all characteristics until the start of the noble's next turn. Anytime the servant attacks a target that the noble dealt damage to last turn, the servant gains 10 plus noble spell bonus percent crit chance. Keep in mind, we are a fellowship class. So anytime we attack a target, if the person we target with you serve me attacks it next, they get like a massive crit bonus against it. So if we put the you serve me on like our sniper, for instance, then we're going to immediately give it extra stats and jack up its crit rate for the entirety of combat, not just for a turn like the, the Navy officer, but like for all of combat. You do something. If the noble uses an ability on their servant, the servant gains one AP next turn. You protect me. If the noble and the servant are adjacent at the, uh, to each other at the start of the noble's turn, they both gain temporary hit points equal to the servant's, the servant's toughness bonus or the noble's fellowship bonus, which is what we're doing, depending on which is higher. You go on. The noble servant gains plus two movement points every turn. You kill it. If the servant kills the target that the noble dealt damage to last turn, the noble gains an extra AP next turn. You, you are next. If the servant has less than 30% max wounds, the noble can use you serve me once more in battle, designating a new servant and removing the effect from the previous one. The noble cannot designate a character who is already their servant in this combat. Man. I think we're gonna do noble. I think I think we're gonna do noble. I really like I really like this idea. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we're I think we're gonna do noble. Let's check out the last one though. Sanctioned psyker. I know a lot of you guys are probably gonna be playing psychers because psychers are totally badass in this universe. So, uh, sanctioned psyker. They have reduced chance to trigger a phenomenon. Psy rating is weak, so it starts weak, obviously. Makes sense. Divinination, biomancy. That's just a cool word, biomancy. Huh. Telepathy, Santic powers, pyromancy. Oh my God, look at all these talents. Yeah, casters in this game are nutty. They're nutty. Anyway, we're going noble. Perfect. Triumph. So I guess this is what made us famous. Your strong presence and pervasiveness stopped a feudal war between neighboring systems, Persuasion 5. You were named planetary governor and survived, having made useful connections on both sides of the law, Commerce 5. You had a rival noble's house reputation destroyed and its members exiled from the sector, Coercion 5. Let's do Apex of Brilliance. This is definitely going to be a persuasion run. Darkest Hour. The mysterious tome that was discovered in your family library exacted a terrible toll on your mind. Lore Warp minus five. You're a bastard. An illegitimate member of a family that immediately turned its back on you. Imperium minus five. 
You were kidnapped for ransom and your captors mistreated you up until the moment you were released. Oh, I don't think, no. Oh. Oh, may give access to new dialogue options. Okay. Uh, let's do this one. Or I, I wonder, I don't, which, whichever one of these is lower for our character we should do. We might come back and revisit this. I do like the idea of being a noble bastard, though. That's kind of cool. Um, but we're going to, yeah, we're going to see, like, what our, whatever our final is. We'll come back and check that out. Yeah. Can I, can you show us the second tab of Psyker? Absolutely. Sanction Psyker Biomancer. Gives you all sorts of fun stuff here to play with. Diviner. Gives you, th this is basically picking like your, your mage class, kind of. Pyromancer. What I'll do real quick is I know some of you maybe at YouTube and at home want to see what these are. So what I'll do is just real quick kind of mouse over them. But if you want, you can go back and pause the stream and read them more yourself if you'd like to. We'll just we'll just do the spells for now. I'm kind of just going over them as I'm sure we're going to need to know these later. Wow, the target ally immediately gains an extra turn with twice their normal the number of their normal MP and the Psyker's Psy rating AP. But their organism is subjected to severe stress, making them suffer 5% wound damage at the end of each turn until the end of combat. <laughs> okay. This is Santic. Finally, telepath. Cool. All right. So that is that is those for those that are interested. Okay, so again, our archetypes are warrior which is kind of like the big melee. Officer, which is support. This is what we're going to be. Um, operative. And actually, you know what? We'll go through this real quick. So warriors are the big melee guys. Um, their, their big movement skill is charge, which is awesome. Helps them get around the battlefield. Um, you can see their different characteristics and skills down here. These are the uh, heroic acts. So heroic acts are positive momentum abilities. Desperate measures are negative morale abilities or, or, or low morale abilities. So if the if basically the way that it works is if shit's hitting the fan and you're losing pretty badly, then you get access to your desperate measures. If you're kicking ass and things are going really well, then you get your heroic acts. It's a cool system. Uh, Ko, I think you chose the wrong darkest hour. No, I, I don't know which one I'm going to do here yet. We're, we're going to kind of take a look at our end skills, so. Yeah, that's the warrior. Officer, we get bring it down. The officer immediately grants an ally an extra turn with action points equal to two and no movement points. If the ally is under the effect of voice of command and kills an enemy before the end of the officer's turn, the ally gains a one-time additional 2x officer's fellowship bonus to momentum. Cool. So we'll want to use... We'll want to use Voice of Command and then bring it down to try to get a kill. Voice of Command. The officer forces an ally to fully push themselves, increasing their characteristics by 5 plus 2 the officer's fellowship bonus for one round. 
Additionally, all of the officer's abilities can be applied to the target of the voice of command from any distance. A character who becomes the target of the voice of command cannot be targeted by this ability again for two rounds. The finest hour. The officer grants an ally an extra turn with full AP and MP. During the extra turn, there is no attack limit. Oh, God. And this is the same thing, except the officer's main stat is halved until the end of combat. Oh, man. Eesh. That's pretty rough. Uh, let's see. Can Co play the whole game, or is the early look restricted? Oh no, we're taking. You're parched. Time for a drink. Thanks, Carol. We we are playing the full game today. This is the full game. Of course, as Doctor Eagles very aptly said, we will not get very far today, as I go very slow, and we're playing on hard difficulty, which means I will be dying all the time, all the time. Enemies will breathe on me heavily, and I will fall over dead. Yeah, Belovic, thank you for the Good five show. bomb, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, Operative. Operative has the Analyze Enemies, which basically is kind of like this, this interesting kind of stacking exploit skill. Um, the, tar the Operative targets one enemy within 10 cells. That target immediately gains one plus int bonus divided by two. As far as I understand, whenever it says like int bonus, fellowship bonus, it's the skill divided by 10. So if we have 50 int, then it would be five divided by two. And I think it, I don't know if it rounds up or down. We'll need to look into that. I'm guessing it rounds up, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, so anytime we see a bonus from a, st um, from a stat, it's the stat divided by 10. Oh, it, it, it's down normally? Always round down. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. A positive modifier applied to a skill or characteristic damage armor. A bonus can be provided for different abilities. Okay. All right, so that's the, the operative. Operatives, of course, are like super good snipers and ranged people. And then soldiers are the masters of all ranged weapons. They have run and gun. The soldier gains two plus agi bonus divided by two MP movement points. Their next attack is minus one AP and does not count towards their attack limit. So run and gun allows them not only to move, but to also get an attack off, and they can attack again that turn. Until the end of the next turn, the soldier becomes winded. While winded, the soldier suffers a minus Good 10 penalty show. to the ballistic skill. Hey, Northern Thunder with a 10. Thank you, bud. Appreciate you. Also got to get that drink in from Geralt. Revel in Slaughter. The soldier immediately removes the winded effect. Until the end of combat, the soldier gains the following bonuses. This ability becomes available after the soldier kills three enemies. The kill counter is not reset between rounds. Okay, so basically after they run and gun, they get winded. And then they have to kill three people to use Revel and Slaughter, which then kind of supercharges them until the end of combat. So that's interesting. Now, how many times can they use running gun? Oh, 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 and also winded only, only lasts till the end of the next turn. Oh, it's every other turn. So until the end of the next turn, the soldier becomes winded. While winded, the soldier suffers a minus 10 ballistic skill and cannot use run and gun. So, so he can run and gun to location, do two attacks. The next turn comes up, he's winded that turn, which means he has a penalty to the ballistic and can't use run and gun. But at the end of that turn, it expires and then they can use run and gun on their third turn. Cool. Okay. Interesting. Nice. So that's a soldier. So going back to what we were talking about, we're going to do officer. We're going to go this kind of support route here. The idea is that, again, we're going to start as a pretty heavy support, but we are going to move not only continually into support, but we're also going to move into like uh, probably a sniper rifle, I'm thinking. Yep. Okay, 
Uh, Mundus, Viver, I'm actually not sure about that. Can you send me a PM with the details? I haven't been following that too much. Give your officer some hair? I wish I could. Well, we'll go back. I, I don't know if we can, like, reappearance this. Oh, cool. We can actually reappearance it after we pick our origins and stuff. It's kind of fun. Can I get a hat? I want a hat. Oh, we can be a fatty. Oh, I like that. I feel like we should be. I feel like we should be a fatty. I feel like that's noble. Yeah, we're doing that. We're gonna get a little chunk on chat. Oh, look at that! Dude looks badass. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's the that's the noble hair right there. That's the noble hair. Oh, I love it, dude. That actually looks pretty pretty baller, man. Kind of I kind of like that look. Do we not get to pick uh Oh, we do get to pick beards. Here we go. Beautiful. That's pretty dashing. Kind of like that actually. Dude, look at all these beards. Oh, this is phenomenal. So many options. It's got a weak chin chat, not feeling it. We need to we need to, yeah, I think I think that's how we need to do it. That's that's what we're looking at right there. Okay. That's I need to find this hat ASAP. We gotta find this hat. Oh no. Did I just reset it by accident? Oh my god, I did. Okay. I have no idea which one we were. I think it was that one. Hold on, let's do let's do this. Wait, 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 wait. Oh no. How did we we totally I have made a huge mistake. Okay. Um Before it would change this whenever we did this, but now it's not. Ooh. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. It was phase two? All right. We'll go with that. That's cool. We'll make it work that. There we go. Looking good, man. Looking good. Beautiful. Beautiful. I like it. Actually, then we're gonna go back. Yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna be a little thinner. A little thinner. Okay. All right, dude. I think I think this is it. The best defense is a good offense. Nice. All right. Homeworld. Hive. Origin, Noble, Triumph, Apex of Brilliance, Darkest Hour, Brand of Shame, Archetype Officer, Characteristics. We need to make sure the Fellowship is all the way up. That means our modifier is now 5 for that. Um, ballistics needs to go up because we are going to be using guns. And then... Hmm. Hmm. I feel like if we do one hit of intelligence and one hit of agility, then we'll get those, we'll get both to four modifiers. Willpower. We don't need to worry too much about willpower right now uh, because we have a trait that makes our fellowship bonus be used instead of our willpower. So 
Tell if you're going range, why did you get Hive World? That homeworld seems geared towards melee builds. So the reason we like Hive World is because I'm going to position him near my back line, probably my range people, which will generate more um, resolve, which is what we really want. Also, it adds to fellowship, which is a which is good, and. It also, most importantly, gives us the ability to use our fellowship value instead of willpower. So this is the main reason is camaraderie. The main reason is camaraderie. That lets us focus a stat to get like all sorts of, of very good resistances. Yeah. Talents are choices you can take after character creation, not things you start with. Only the willpower resistance, yes, yes. The resistance tests only, yes. Not for dialogue checks. So willpower is gonna tank you in dialogue checks? Really? So... Hmm. The talent spell out co. Um, appreciate that, Owlcat. Thank you. So uh, we, we apparently have to go this one. It's a sign. Yeah, we're, we're doing it. But what I will do is I think I might drop in for a little bit of willpower in that case. Bring that up a bit. At least make it basic. But that's interesting. I do want to be... I do want to be a strong... I do want to be a strong class for dialogues. But I guess, yeah, I have 60 persuasion, which is good. 55 coercion, which is good. But I guess willpower is something we have to be in there as well. Okay. Huh. For the warp? It says here, Willpower reflects the character's ability to withstand the horrors of the warp, the terrors of space, and the dreadful opponents they are bound to encounter in the Cronus Expanse. High willpower allows characters to exert control over a crowd or interrogate a heretic. It also increases the chances of resisting negative mental effects of psychic powers. So, our fellowship is going to be used for the last part. But, high willpower allows characters to exert control over a crowd or interrogate a heretic. That seems cool. That seems like something we really want. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I think we're I think we're gonna try this though. I think we're gonna try this. Yeah, this is all this is all a learning experience. We're gonna try it. We're gonna try it. So looking at this, by the way, what is I guess I guess for here we just kinda have to choose. We're gonna do minus five warp. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do Grim Portents. There we go. All right, next up is Void Ship. Um, the Von Valencius flagship is the mightiest void ship to belong to the Valencius dynasty. Dynasty? 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 Um, the flagship size maneuverability are perfect for pursuing smaller, faster raiders and for hunting the countless pirates, Xenos, and heretics of the Cronus Expanse. Um, okay. Falchion class frigate. They're more advanced in modern design, was developed only five centuries ago, but has proven to be as good as veteran fighters like the sword class. Okay. Is this just graphics? Or am I like... Yo! Thank you, Madrika. Okay. So these are different ships. Dude, it doesn't give us, like, stats, though. Edit button. I think it's just the name, bro.
the Gary Kiskunikis. Wait. The Gary Kunikis Chonkaka. Chonkia. There we go. The Gary Kunika Chonkia. Okay. Beautiful. I really like the look of this ship. I like the look of all these ships. I love how this one just has this giant statue at the back. I love how this one has these two gigantic rail guns right here. I, I do I like the, I like that little house on this one. We're gonna go with the little house. All right, here we go. Great, Chat, This is our guy. This is it. I hope you guys enjoyed this hour-long character creation experience. <laughs> okay. Do it. Applause, please. 